time's up. It's uh, time to start our last seminar this season. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Dieter Mikeller from Ongeof Observatory, uh, who will uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, MHD flows at astroposes and in astrotails. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for welcome. And uh, I will talk about um, stellar wind cavities. And um, basically, I'm uh, studying uh, magnetospheres in the most general uh, sense. So I'm interested in magnetic fields, in uh, stellar winds, but also in uh, planetary magnetospheres. And um, therefore, my subject is dedicated to the separatrix surfaces of uh, different regions of magnetic field and plasma flows in space plasmas. And one is here this uh, MHD flows at astroporses and astrotails. And I want to talk about the basic principles of such a counterflow configuration, uh, which we can naturally find in uh, astrophysical environments. For example, if you have a star, here, here it's indicated by this sun here, so we have the, our planetary system, which is about, let's say, 50 astronomical units in diameter. And, um, well, some uh, years ago, I think in the 70s, uh, yeah, the Voyager spacecrafts were started and uh, they investigate now this large scale heliosphere. And this is an interesting environment because we here now we have a solar wind. This is solar plasma flow. And uh, we have a star which has a relatively strong magnetic field. And then we have, of course, the interstellar medium. And there, where this uh, interaction takes place between the uh, interstellar plasma flow on one hand and the solar or in general a stellar wind flow. We are interested in this is uh, then here you can see this is the termination shock. The solar wind plasma flow decelerates here and uh, <clears throat> Voyager reached it in, I think in about 2004 and um, now Voyager is a little bit more further than here indicated. It's I think about more than 120 astronomical units and there are people thought that they can see, with, her, with the help of Voyager instruments, they can see the heliopause. Yeah? So this is this region here. And now <clears throat> the question is, of course, what are the typical boundaries for such a stellar wind interstellar medium interaction region? I mean, here it is relatively clear in this uh, V-graph. Uh, we have basically a three, um, a th a three structured um, interface, but I will come to the details later. <laughs> So the motivation is the interaction between different plasma flows. And I will uh, then talk a little bit out about our theoretical approach. I'll give some examples how such interaction regions can look like and what it has to do also with plasma heating and particle acceleration uh, via the theory of magnetohydrodynamics. Okay, so basically everybody knows this. You have a stream, you have a small river, and you have a stone inside. And <clears throat> if you have now a flow around an, obs pardon, a flow around an obstacle, you basically would accept, would, uh, would think that, well, somewhere this flow has to stop because the obstacle will decelerate the flow. And this happens, in fact, also if you take this from hydrodynamical textbooks or so, you have here the cylinder, then you have the, this flow around this obstacle, and here you have a, a stagnation point. Stagnation point means that this is a null point of the corresponding vector field, namely of a flow field. And um, so you should have at least one null point. If the object is closed, well, we know at least from the cylindrical flows or also when you stretch this via conformal mappings, for example, that you have maybe two null points. You know? So it's a closed object with two null points. But what happens now um, when you have, for example, um, not a solid object, but really something which reacts on the flow in that sense that, for example, here inside is a source. You know? This is a simply a solid object, but not you have basically no source of an, of an outflow. So um, the question is, um, well, one can think of the stellar flows, which are then circling around. Yeah? So we, uh, a finite object must not have at least two null points, like indicated, but it can also have um, maybe only one. If, uh, if, if, it's, if it has one, it's, it's, it will be open. If it has two, it is closed. Okay. So we can think, for example, of diffusion of the plasma. Yeah? So the plasma is collected in this uh, cavity here. Now, if it's inside here, it would uh, be a star or something like that. And then 
uh, we would have some kind of uh, stagnation in this region and so on. But um, Parker, 1961, he made, said, okay, basically we can think that uh, due to turbulence and so on, we have here some in pressure, we would have here some drag and there would be some outflow. Okay, so this is uh, some kind of analogy which we can, uh, we can uh, view on, uh, have a view on when we compare the sun on one hand and let's say a typical planet. The planet has, of course, usually no planetary wind, but it has a different kind of obstacle. It's not the wind, the obstacle, but the magnetic field. Yeah? So, for example, here we have the Earth. Magnetic fields, basically a dipole close to the Earth, but here, due to the solar wind, it's stretched out to a tail-like structure. So you can find similar structures, let's say, also in the case of uh, cometary flows, or flows around comets. And um, so we can also think that a lot of stars, which have really a dominating stellar wind, or at least strong magnetic fields, or both, that they can have such a tail. Yeah. So what do we have? We have a sun, the star in the middle, the solar wind, which is decelerated here to subsonic speeds, or super, uh, sub, uh, sub, uh, phonic speeds, if we take magnetic fields into account. And then we would have here some kind of, um, well, more or less uh, tail-like structure, which is here enclosed by the heliopause, or astropause in general. And outside, if uh, the flow here outside is really very strong, we can have an additional bow shock. Uh, the um, nomenclature is because there that we have here inside, we have some kind of uh, uh, so-called inner heliosheath. Outside, we have kind of the outer heliosheath, and this is the region between the uh, stellar wind surface here. And, um, well, I think this was also yeah, named by, by Baranov, Baranov interface sometimes. And it means that really that you have some, this kind of three, uh, three structure here, the heliospheric shock, pause, and, uh, of course, the outer bow shock. So our aim is uh, now in this talk to investigate a little bit the representation and classification of counterflow configurations like this. And um, if we start with the complicated one, with 3D, <clears throat> well, we have um, different, uh, well, part, uh, different types of null points. We said a null point is in, seems to be important to stop this flow. And um, if we think now of null points of 3D vector fields, you can have different types. These different types here are listed, and these are the only ones which exist. So these are, uh, let's say, it's some kind of prototypes of null points. And um, you can analyze uh, from simulations or analytical calculations vector fields very properly, and you will find out that you only have really a separating surface, so in that sense a pause, if you have these four types of flows. Then you have here this kind of uh, stable or unstable manifold, which allows you, yeah, here you see it can come some, some um, field line or streamline, some singular field line comes in, here's this null point, and uh, basically if you have a really a, an astropause, you would expect here comes the flow in, so this would be this case here, the flow comes in, and then here it goes out. Yeah? So this is some, some very typical scenario, what, what one can expect. And um, the other case uh, would be uh, maybe this one. Yeah? So these two types would, would be possible. This would be not so possible for the flow, but for a magnetic field, it would be possible. Yeah? So the question is now, do we take null points of magnetic fields into account or the flow? Because up to now we have only sp spoken about a hydropause, or, which was for us the helioastropause. <clears throat> but the point is the following. The uh, environments of stellar winds are relatively complex sometimes. So you can have neutral particles, for example. You can have uh, very heavy ions, which also move with respect to these boundaries. And um, so the question is, if you have several types of fluids inside such a cavity, stellar wind cavity, of course, the problem is, what the hell is now then the astropause? So if you take the magnetic field into account, uh, then you can say, okay, we have something like a magnetopause, so it's comparable almost to planetary magnetospheres which have no wind. Uh, so uh, this is a <clears throat> basically unsolved problem, and um, I prefer, of course, as I like magnetic fields, I would prefer this definition to take namely the magnetopause. But this is sometimes uh, not so easy, so when we dis would discuss here solutions of this problem here, it is very problematically in the field of simulations. I will come to this point maybe later on. So let us first think, 
take a very, very simple view on 2D. Yeah? We, have, we have this cylinder with the flow around. So <clears throat> if you look now on uh, typical 2D null points, then you can see here that we have also some very specific types of null points. Um, this is a similar structure like in uh, 3D, but not all configurations are here structurally stable. As I said before, we need a real separatrix. And in this case, only two topological, topologically stable uh, points to exist, namely the O points. So these are closed field lines here on the plane. And uh, the so-called X points, yeah, because it has, uh, if you look tilted a little bit, then it, this would have the form shape of an X. And these are also hyperbolic null points. So they define here really two separatrix lines. Yeah? So we, one of these, for example, if you would say that here's the sun, here's the, the flow, yeah, or the magnetic field, here comes um, here's a stagnation point, and here they go further along the heliopause. It would be then the heliopause. Now map only to this 1D manifold. Okay, so we have now basically the, let's say, the tools. And now the question is how to calculate on such uh, vector fields corresponding exact analytical MHD equilibria. Um, <clears throat> well, there are several ways, of course, to, to tackle this problem. If you're talking about some separatic surface in the form of an astropause or heliopause, then, of course, <laughs> one of the things, well, of course, a thing will move. It will, can oscillate. You have stellar or solar cycles which will change uh, completely the structure during years or decades where the solar wind emanates uh, into the interstellar medium. And um, therefore, there are, of course, a lot of uh, approaches to this problem during the last decades. There's this two short model from Baranov and Dusunoni. They have made an analytical approach, but only take into account uh, the um, uh, induction equation. And uh, so they calculated the magnetic field from a given uh, prescribed uh, velocity field. And then there are, of course, a lot of simulations during the last two, 20 or 30 years, 20 years more, I would say. But um, <clears throat> in fact, um, uh, the, um, if you use, want to use really exact concepts of this uh, boundary surface, then um, we will, uh, um, have to find very clearly precise definitions of this. And uh, Barker did this uh, far in 1993. And uh, we also tried to, to find some uh, better approach to this problem. So if you want to solve the problem now from, an, from a relatively physically simplified but exact mathematical way, you uh, take into account a quasi-steady approach, for example. And for stability reasons, we use field-aligned incompressible flows because in the frame of uh, MHD stability theory, it turns out that these are the most which are probably uh, with high probability, stable. So one can now think ideal MHD means you have basically a, in, in very high electrical conductivity of this plasma, so that the magnetic field is frozen into the flow, and this uh, has some advantages, but also disadvantages, disadvantages as we will later see. Okay. So I will show now the uh, used equations we solved. Uh, first of all, um, well, these are not familiar with these equations here. We have the mass continuity equation. Then we have, um, you know, the, always the mass density, V is the velocity of the plasma. Then we have uh, the force equation with a pressure gradient, you know, with the plasma or thermal pressure, the Lorentz force. Here, yeah, J is, uh, comes from Ampere's law, so this is uh, um, so the curls of the um, magnetic field. This is the current, so this is the microscopic Lorentz force. And these forces here should be, be balanced in the plasma flow. Then we have here the ideal induction equation of ideal MHD. And <coughs> in the case that we are really thinking about um, relatively stable flow, as I said at the beginning here, we take into account um, a field aligned flow, which is here defined via the alpha and Mach number. So the alpha and Mach number says, uh, compares the uh, alpha speed with the real plasma speed, and um, the alpha speed here is given as a vector, in fact, because the magnetic field says in which direction this vector should show, so here we have um, the alpha speed, and um, then we can see if V is really parallel to B, like indicated here by our restriction here, this is law is automatically fulfilled, so we have no resistance, which can, for example, produce uh, instabilities. 
Okay, and then in an analogy to the incompressible magnetic field, we have the incompressibility here of the flow field. So, what do we know now from this? Now, we, you know, we can solve this equation, in fact, exactly, and the exact solution can be found by <clears throat> the similarity between, on one hand, incompressible uh, hydrodynamics and steady or static magnetohydrodynamics. So it means that we have a, if we have a magnetohydrostatic equilibrium, so compare, for example, something which you can construct for uh, planetary magnetospheres, then you can take a flow and let flow this around, this uh, field lines, and in this case, you would get a stable flow, maybe, which resembles an outflow far away from a stellar wind, from, from a stellar wind source, and from the sun, for example. And um, these um, equilibria here are calculated then via the magnetohydrostatic equilibrium equation. This is this equation here. You have the plasma pressure, which is counterbalanced by the Lorentz force. In addition, <clears throat> we can find out if the flow is really incompressible, then we can find this law here for the density. So the density is, a lo is constant along magnetic field lines, which are the same as streamlines in this case. And also the alpha and Mach number is constant along the field lines. But it does, of course, not mean that both are constant in whole space. So they can vary perpendicular to the field lines. And if we have solved this system here, which is sometimes also not very easy, it depends on boundary conditions or constraints, then we can find a transformation so that we can find, in fact, a steady flow. And this is given here by the general solution found first uh, by Gebhardt and Kiesling in 1992, <clears throat> although there are a little bit older references, back to the 70s and 80s, but they are unfortunately not published in um, um, papers, uh, in reference papers, or they are pa uh, published in Zeitschrift für Naturforschung, for example, from the 70s there is some, some paper, but it's very rare and it's, it's hard to get this uh, paper, and of course it's not uh, readable for most people. Uh, so, um, I uh, will only give a short introduction to this uh, transformation. As you see, you take here simply the steady, so the static uh, components of the magnetic field and of the pressure, and you can transform this into the steady state variables. And <coughs> pardon. here we have now, of course, something, some variable which does not exist before. This is the velocity field now. This gives the flow here. This is the field line flow. And um, what is very interesting now is, um, for example, usually if you have a planetary magnetosphere or if you have an almost static uh, stellar magnetosphere <coughs> with, a, with a very small stellar wind only, you would say, OK, I can take some kind of multipole fields, for example. Multipole fields means that you have no current. But um, if you apply now a flow, you have to compensate somehow the flow forces on this magnetic field. And um, this is reflected here by this equation, for example. You get the current, which is transformed like this here. This is a static current. If you assume now a multipole field, potential field, then this term would be basically zero. But if <clears throat> you have very, uh, let's say, strong gradients of the alpha and Mach number perpendicular to the field lines, you can have a very, very strong enhanced current, even though. OK, so we know now that you can in fact, calculate such uh, flows, field line flows, if we are far away from uh, the star, where the field and the flow maybe should be re relaxed, and um, where instead of, uh, <coughs> of uh, the fact that uh, we have a constant pressure along field lines, we have now a constant Bernoulli pressure along field lines. And with this, we can, in fact, calculate um, the steady state flows. Okay, but now the question is, <coughs> in general, how we come to the case that we can say, for example, that some um, of these values are constant along field lines. Well, this lies in the structure of MHD. If you look, for example, in magnetohydrostatics, you can find very easily that the static pressure, as I mentioned before, must be constant along field lines. Uh, so um, this is a conserved value now, and <coughs> This is a uh, reason usually in symmetries. Symmetries imply conservation laws in physics. So 
PS is conserved along field lines, and PS is so called the first <coughs> integral of, of this magnetic field. So <coughs> very often in fusion research, but also in uh, astrophysical plasmas, uh, this representation is used for the magnetic field. Instead of using one vector potential for the magnetic field, you use two scalar potentials, so-called Euler potentials. And um, the answer is directly then given that the pressure here is a function of alpha and beta, and therefore constant on these surfaces. <coughs> Pardon. <coughs> I have a little cold. <clears throat> okay, so what about surfaces? The surfaces are organized in such a way that, um, <clears throat> that the field lines uh, are penetrating them only once, usually, or only on a finite number. And <clears throat> on, the, on the other hand, um, here, if you have uh, the grade, if you give the, gra the gradient here, like down here in this, the gradient of alpha would be every time, of course, perpendicular to the surface alpha, and this here also. So, what you can do is you construct the surfaces now, so such that they intersect in such a way that here you have the field line, intersecting the field lines, the gradient is now perpendicular to one surface, the, perpen the Gradient beta here is perpendicular to this other surface, so the cross product gives simply the direction of the magnetic field. <clears throat> and this helps us to formulate basically the uh, theory on which we can here and there easily ca calculate, or more easily calculate, uh, nonlinear equilibria. Sometimes it's a mess, it's really uh, very, very uh, difficult to do this because the equations are then non-linear from the beginning, yeah, because you have these two potentials instead of one. Okay, this was too fast. <coughs> if we think now that one, uh, that we take one vector potential A here, and we have only a Z component, then you see that the structure here of the following magnetic field derived from this vector potential is basically that you have here this alpha, yeah, and here you have beta. Beta is Z, so this is a plane surface. Gradient of Z is EZ nothing else. So it's exactly the unit vector which shows in that direction. So for our 2D MHS equilibria, yeah, we can directly formulate this with the help of these Euler potentials. And it turns out then that, of course, the static pressure must be a function of uh, these Euler potentials. In this case, it's only a function then of one of these Euler potentials, namely of A. So what we got in this case is then a nonlinear or quasi-linear partial differential equation it's called the Gratschaf-Ranov equation, and it was discovered basically end of the 50s, beginning of the 60s, and um, it was very often used for constructing static magnetospheres either, or static structures on the sun, for example, prominence equilibria, or for fusion plasmas also. So if we have solved this equation now, everything would be nice, we have a static equilibrium, and then we can we could, we'd be able to construct our flow. Uh, <clears throat> there's only one small problem, because we do, do not know really this function. Yeah, so there are several choices possible, because it's a, a constant of motion, A. Um, <clears throat> this can be very difficult. Okay, so if we do this in 2D now, we move now again to the static equilibrium, uh, to the steady equilibrium, pardon. <coughs> if we introduce here some new flux function alpha instead of A for the static equilibrium, we have to make a transformation, alpha of A or A of alpha, <clears throat> which transforms back the uh, steady equations. And in fact, then we found the same equation as for the static field, namely here, this Gratschaf-Ranov type equation. We have only one point now to explain. First of all, we are searching for this pressure function, but then we have also the price to pay that we have this connection between the alpha and Mach number for the flow and the new steady state potential. Yeah? So in all these values are basically depending on the static potential. Okay, the recipe is choose the pressure function, pi, as function of A, which is not clear, then solve the gratschaf ranoff equation, and then we have basically the freedom to take constraints or boundary conditions and to, to impose a flow on every field line, A is equal to constant, by choosing this Mach number, which is also constant on field lines. 
Okay, there are three possibilities <coughs> which are known, um, often used, but they are not the only ones. First of all, we simply assume that PS is constant in whole space. So we have no problem because then Laplace is equal to zero and we can solve this Laplace equation with standard methods. The same is basically true for the um, so-called linear current. It leads to the Helmholtz equation then, which is uh, similar to the Schrodinger's equation. And then this is what we usually case for collisionless plasmas or uh, plasmas which are only slightly collisional. And this is called the so-called Liouville's equation or Liouville equation. And this is a highly nonlinear equation, which to solve is usually very ugly. So of course, when we start for a relatively uh, simple configuration of a magnetic field, <coughs> um, then of course one should, would start here first with this year and then analyze the properties of the corresponding solutions. And um, in the case of these potential fields, we uh, can use, for example, the theory of conformal mappings. So uh, we can take this cylinder, which I showed at the beginning, and then map this. And um, what we are, can do here is we, first of all, take the sun or the star as some kind of source in the middle. So this is a kind of singularity. And uh, we assume that this, if they're all, is, uh, they're all is a terminator, so really a shock around this star, uh, a termination shock, then we uh, say simply this is some kind of inner boundary condition for our calculations. <coughs> then uh, we can use the theory of complex numbers. We simply say we define here this uh, complex number x plus i, y. We can define complex uh, potential, complex magnetic field. And we can then take uh, the real parts as the scalar magnetic potential, the imaginary part as the magnetic uh, flux function or vector potential. And we have an expression also for the complex magnetic field. So this is very nice and very convenient because we can use a very general ansatz for the magnetic field using so-called Laurent series. <coughs> this is some kind of extension of a Taylor series. And we have the uh, advantage here um, that we can easily satisfy asymptotic boundary conditions by assuming that uh, we take only the main part of this Laurent series, or mainly the main part, and only for the star, which anyway is a singularity in our picture here, we take this logarithmic part. <clears throat> and uh, one knows this from hydrodynamical textbooks that um, usually you have some kind of circulation. Circulation normally tells you that you have streamlines like this here around some object. And of course, if we say this is not a real circulation, but maybe a complex one, so you can also have uh, also an imaginary part, you can emulate a radial outflow from the system, from the inner part. So and if we have this magnetic field now, we can calculate this simply from if der deriving here the, the complex vector potential. And <clears throat> we are searching for special points where the magnetic field and the corresponding vector field is zero, then we would have, in fact, our null points. So we would have a direct correlation between null points on one hand and the multipole moments. And in fact, we can find these null points relatively easily, namely they are Vieta's theorem of roots, which is very well known. So the point is the following. If we have now the knowledge where all these stagnation points or magnetic null points are located, we would be able really to calculate all these uh, multipoles here, and then we would have at least at least one we would have, namely the shape and the topology of the uh, magnetic field structure. And so this uh, this uh, null points then <coughs> or magnetic neutral points would determine the global geometrical and topological shape of this stellar cavity. Okay, let's take let's start simply with a. As an example now, with a very, very simple example, namely with the cylinder we know. Well, if you look into this cylinder, usually if you ask an engineer, he will have some car or an aerofoil or something like that. And so uh, this is kind of black box inside, there's of course no flow, it's a solid body. But we are interested now also in the, at least at some parts, the inner flow close here to the separatic surface. So 
This will be a, a very, very, very simple toy uh, astrosphere. So the star would sit here inside, and here the flow would circulate only. Um, what we have to assume to construct this in the, in the shape of this Laurent series is that we have two null points. Yeah? And now I take some heliospheric values, which is a little bit exaggerated, because if this would be the heliosphere, yeah, the flow somehow would circulate back and it would be very turbulent. Inside the solar cavity, it would be saved, the, the material. And we know that solar wind goes out from Voyager measurements. Okay. But let us assume simply that it would look like that. Here is symmetric. <coughs> symmetric means it is closed. Now, if we move this stagnation point and make it to a virtual null point, yeah? so we move it inside and study then how this system deforms, we see that now, in fact, yeah, this solar wind cavity opens at least to one side here. And this is exactly what we wanted to have. We say, OK, if the wind is very strong, it will try to escape and not to stay simply in the closed magnetosphere. So we would have open field and streamlines, and uh, here a small channel would open. <coughs> if we go further with the stagnation point towards here the pole, towards the source of the stellar wind, then it would be open more and more. Okay. This works? Yeah. Stellar two works also. Okay. And at the end, we went at uh, this, this year, so now this virtual stagnation point, which is not a stagnation point anymore, is now sitting here at the pole, so at the solar, basically, on the, in the sun. And uh, what we have now is a pure radial outflow, which is superimposed by a uh, homogenic outflow <coughs> outside, a homogeneous outflow. And this produces that what Parker found out in 1961. He took an um, exosymmetric case, but it's also basically two-dimensional. And he also found that then the uh, heliopause would really completely open, and so you would have a heliotail here in further distances. Okay, so um, <clears throat> we'll take later on take this model here to analyze the mappings, but let me remark some interesting additional features of this uh, Laurent series in, uh, applied to such kind of um, topological determination of uh, astrospheres. <clears throat> Namely, if we now, again, take this stagnation point and shift not in the, in, in the right-hand direction, the tail direction, but in the other direction, and take this null point really for series, then we would dedicate, and then we would see that um, another, uh, let's say, pause would form here in front, yeah? because everywhere where you have these null points of X-type, and the X-type null points here, you have additional pauses, yeah? so we have additional separators. So it would mean that if, um, when we think of Voyager, Voyager crosses now different parts of the uh, magnetic field of the sun, and pa different parts of flows. So basically one would expect if the flow is really much more complicated than only a radial outflow, and a homogeneous outflow at infinity, then there should be several separators. Somehow it should be seen. Yeah? So, so it is clear that uh, uh, sun, uh, suns like star has uh, sometimes shocks inside. You have, uh, of course, interaction regions. But if um, you average the flow, even then you should see some kind of additional separatrix surface. And here this is an extreme case where you have a double, double null point. Um, here, for example, you would have it would be uh, the case <clears throat> if you have spiraling field lines. Yeah? If you have spiraling field lines and they are superimposed by the outflow, then you can see here that suddenly you get an asymmetric astropause. And um, now comes the strange point where it seems that uh, heliosphere is not exactly symmetrical. I mean, this was a toy model, so basically a toy model on one hand. But on the other hand, we can see a several, uh, let's say, drops, increases in sudden decreases of the magnetic field structure. Yeah? And <clears throat> These changes here were taking place in, I think, 2012, around. <coughs> so people say at, at some point, I think it is, uh, I think it's this point here, they say, well, we have crossed the heliopause because um, you see here a sudden decrease in uh, particles per second. But the plasma instruments of Voyager are not really uh, a proper shape, let's say, so uh, people cannot say much about the real 
uh, bulk flow of the plasma. So uh, we can measure some uh, energetic particles and so on, but uh, it's not completely clear if really Voyager has crossed the heliopause. It's heavily discussed. Some people say no, some people say yes. But what we think, should think about really, if we have here different kind of drops, uh, so it could be really possible that um, Voyager has seen several pauses now, meanwhile, so several shells of these separated surfaces. And um, this would be, of course, an interesting view. And uh, one could think, for example, <clears throat> of the sparker spiral, which is extending now, really, because the sun is rotating. The magnetic field is a little bit wound up around the sun. Also, if you go more than 50 or 100 astronomical units outside, and if you emulate this here by our relatively simple model, you can find here an, really another uh, separatrix with a, with a two point, null point model. And you can see it's asymmetric. And of course, if Voyager would now flow in this or in this direction, some, some spacecraft, you would really see here some <laughs> separatrix surfaces. And across the separatrix surfaces, you can have drops of magnetic field and density. OK, so <clears throat> our model at least uh, could basically uh, describe this. And uh, the question is now how to calculate on this topological or geometrical model a real physical model. Now, the mapping ansatz I showed, this is a connection between alpha, the steady state potential, and A, the static potential, which we used. And um, when we have the tail now, we have a south and a north what tail, give you pause, and um, you put now a drop, this tangent superbolicus function here, this emulates quasi a step function. And this step function would then mean that we have some kind of drop of the magnetic field. So this uh, <clears throat> function would enable us to model such drops. This is the thickness of, the, of this uh, magnetic field drop, which is a current sheet, the current sheet thickness. And this is a position. And uh, these are the strengths of the corresponding fields. And this here is the uh, asymptotical Mach number. So this is the outer Mach number, really, which you can find if you would go across the tail and far away in the interstellar medium. So this is a boundary condition we can use here for the mapping. And if we calculate now all this here, <clears throat> and assume that we have not only this uh, uh, static field, that we have uh, the, it to strengthen, to st maybe it's, it's, stronger, usually it's stronger than the static field, and then we can find here corresponding symmetric boundary condition for the system. We take now this simple Parker model, so not the asymmetric, but the symmetric case. And um, if we do this, we find a connection between the symmetric jump and the outer and inner Mach number. We can directly calculate this. So we can say something about the jump. And uh, we can then construct really the mapping exactly when we assume some parameters here. Now this is um, roughly that what is uh, measured by different spacecrafts, by Voyager. Uh, we can have some information, I think, about the plasma density here which is given from, uh, let's say, remote observing. We know a little bit about, about the very local interstellar medium flow. You know, the sun moves through the very local interstellar medium with respect to about 25 kilometers per second. And we have some information about that. <clears throat> Maybe the field is a little bit weaker here than indicated by me. Maybe it's only four and three microgauss, but this is only order of magnitude. And we can then calculate also inner and outer um, Mach numbers, and um, <coughs> what we see that if we apply this model, this relatively simplified model, to the tail, is the following, namely that um, we see here the field lines and, st uh, and streamlines. These are here the heliopause field lines, yeah, extended from the null point here in front of the heliopause nose, and here are the current isocontour lines. You see that they deviate now from, from these lines here. And this means that really here you have some structuring of this current sheet. And um, the current density in this case would look like this here. The units does not do not play a huge role, but <coughs> um, you can see here that we take into account the current sheet thickness of 100 astronomical units, which means that the tail is several hundred astronomical units wide. And this is maybe a little bit exaggerated, because it would mean we have a really flurry a very uh, kind of, of uh, pause region. 
Um, in this case, we would here see here the jump of the magnetic field, which is not very strong. No? It's only about one micro gauss. Um, and um, the same is true here. The jump you can see a little bit here is pink in the uh, Y component. And here in the, uh, it's the total strength of the magnetic field, you can see it much better. The X component is, of course, the main component. And, um, well, if we go to smaller values, <coughs> then we uh, can see that uh, the current sheet thickness, uh, of course, is uh, having a strong influence on the current density. It grows. And uh, the Mach number here is indicated the fact that inside we have the so uh, solar wind plasma, which is decelerated, and outside we have um, alpha Mach number is higher here, so you have a drop. And this drop causes that we, what we have seen as a current sheet. Yeah? This is amazing. mainly this what produces the current sheet thing, uh, the strength. So now if you think about an object, we have now seen a tail where the field points into one direction in X direction in this case. So if you think now we have a, really an object where the magnetic field lines are draped around, and you will have an anti-parallel field. Because if the magnetic field lines drape around this uh, obstacle, they can have different direction on different sides of the heliopause. And um, we've taken here now one uh, example of a nonlinear model I mean, from, from the Leovitz equation. This is a static equilibrium now. Um, I don't want to go into the details how to get the solutions, <clears throat> but uh, it is a solution of uh, this relatively simple looking nonlinear equation. And in this case, now we have the case that, we, that the field lines really wind around the helios pause boundary. And some of the geospheric um, physicists, like Ofan Drake, for example, they assume really that uh, the um, flow is so strong that it drapes the field line around the nose of the heliosphere, and they <clears throat> found evidence for this. It's not really proved completely, but it seems this, this can be a possible solution. So in this case, our simple potential field model would not hold, and we have to assume that we have an maybe antiparallel field at different sides of the heliopause. Okay, such a model could look like this, for example. <clears throat> uh, unfortunately, as a model, it's nonlinear. We can expect turbulences, we can expect instabilities. And um, what now happens then is that we have not only X points, but we can also have uh, so-called O points. So instead of a really stable tail, which is simply stretched out, <clears throat> um, we can find, for example, that we have different so-called plasmoids. These are plasma clouds here, which are, have closed field lines. And <clears throat> now the point is the following. The field lines now here going up and here going down, yeah? because it is it's co completely wrapped around the heliosphere, where the sun, let's say, sits here somewhere. And in this case, the question is, um, what about the flow? Now, the flow must be shown in one direction, so we have to construct now on this magnetic field lines a flow which serves as a field uh, aligned stellar wind and interstellar medium flow. <clears throat> and we are showing here um, a model where we construct it in the following way. We um, assume that the Mach number outside changes its sign so that we have really one preferred direction of the flow yeah, because the magnetic field polarity changes, and the Mach number also. So we have basically one flow direction. And here inside, for example, you can have some vortices. No? A vortex is normal. If you have really a solution of such a plasma cloud, one can, for example, assume that um, you get uh, these uh, plasma clouds get some kick, and so they have some angular momentum. This is only an example how such an instability can go on. And um, if you apply this now, the parameters should not play any role now. Then we find the following. <clears throat> the static contour yeah, is uh, given here by this structure here. So you have two bulges of the current corresponding to these two plasma clouds here. So you have a lot of plasma there inside. And um, the current is given, of course, by uh, plasma density times the drift speed. So uh, where you have a high density, you have also a high current density, yeah, which is seen here by these two maxima. But now if we apply this uh, additional, this, this flow on these field lines, 
we have to compensate the additional Lorentz forces and their flow forces. <clears throat> and it turns out then that we have a kind of fragmentation of this current. can happen in usually a very well-ordered magnetic field is a large question. And here we can show that if we go to such, such small scales with small scale shear flows, we can have very easily such uh, problems. Now, I would um, <clears throat> finish this part of my talk and I would uh, then mention only what these shear flows really can, can induce. So I change a little bit the view now um, I will show well, even if we have a field which is, let's say, a potential field, for example, a poloidal field which lies in the xy plane, and we shear this field only a little bit with the z component, and we uh, apply uh, the shear flow to uh, produce such a magnetic field, <clears throat> we um, have to think about the following. If we really produce strong currents, and this is one of the points. Usually, you use ideal Ohm's law. Ideal Ohm's law means you have no coll collisions or collisions are not important. But if we produce very short spatial scales, we can come down <coughs> to, uh, uh, let's say, scales where we have not a collisional resistivity, like indicated here. And this is uh, Ohm's law in case of resistive MHD. Electric field. Uh, here the Lorentz force, and then we have here the, the electric field in the co-moving system of the plasma. This is simply given by eta j. Eta is the resistivity, or it's the inverse of the conductivity. So it, conductivity is extremely high usually, as I said, in collisionless plasmas. So this would be zero, yeah? so this would be ideal MHD. But even if we have a field line flow, we can have an electric field if this term here is relatively large. So the question is how to make it large? Well, of course, via enhancing of the current density. Now, usually, eta is a transport coefficient, which is uh, calculated somehow by kinetic theory, or it's assumed to be collisional. But we can also think of so-called collisionless resistivities. And they are very important as far uh, as we come to very high current densities. In this case, um, we can easily find out that in such nonlinear cases, <coughs> we have a coupling between the resistivity and this magnetic or velocity shear, now, which is given here by this term. We have here a function which resembles the resistance of the plasma. This resistance here, psi, um, can be led back not to Spitzer resistivity. Huh? We cannot compare this with a usual collisional uh, resistivity. And in the case of turbulent collision, which are usually ta taken, they are relatively not stationary. So if we want to have really some process which accelerates particles, then we should go, of course, to uh, find a stationary solution, a stationary resistivity source, and uh, we are, would have to consider non-collision effects. We can do this, in fact. It has been done for the magnetosphere long ago. The concept is that um, instead of collisions, <coughs> We uh, substitute these uh, interactions here by the so-called uh, Speiser resistivity or gyro resistivities. And um, they are simply connected by the fact that they are effective if the density, n here, the number density, is very small and the magnetic field uh, is very large. Then you see that the conductivity drops. Resistivity is the inverse of conductivity. So we get high resistivity if we have really a high magnetic field and a small uh, current, uh, and the small uh, density, particle density, pardon. The particle density, if the particle density is uh, very low, <clears throat> we can therefore get very strong resistivities. The question is now, where does this happen? Well, in the magneto tail of the Earth, we know there are some regions where we can apply this picture, but in the corona, usually, um, where we have also there are high density regions, especially there where the sun is very active. So this is also a turbulent and 
eruptive plasma. Um, but what about the heliotail? Well, from our heliotail measurements, we know, or from the indirect measurements and models, we know that the density is pretty low. So if we apply this here, we can in fact find that the, um, um, that the resistivity is uh, orders of magnitude larger than the turbulent or collision null resistivity. Of course, collision resistivity in the heliotail, if you have these densities here, um, it's uh, 10 to the 4 particles per cubic meter. This is extremely low. So it's um, much lower than even the heliotail or in the uh, <clears throat> vicinity of the solar atmosphere. So the heliotail will be very, very small. And then this gyro resistivity can be very high. And so it can be very active there. And it, as we have really tail like field lines, very stretched field lines, one can show that um, it is very interesting to look on. Uh, the electric field parallel to the magnetic field, because only these electric field components can effectively accelerate electric charged particles. And what we find now is something which, for the sun or for, for other space plasmas, which are relatively close here to Earth or sun, are ridiculously low. It's 10 to the minus 6 volt per meter. Yeah? In the sun, you have uh, uh, at least four orders of magnitude larger electric fields to accelerate solar energetic particles. But here it's very, very small. And um, the only point is, of course, that we have enough space. So it means, as we have a collision-less plasma, <clears throat> uh, basically we are along the uh, tail field lines possible. We have uh, enough space to accelerate these particles. And uh, the order of magnitude is about 100 AU, so we can, can make at least an estimation for this kind of acceleration. And the acceleration here is a uh, then so strong that we can get to, let's say, subrelativistic values. I mean, this is a little bit exaggerated here because we have taken into account that we can really, basically, without any problems, accelerate particles about uh, many um, tens or maybe hundreds of AU. This is, of course, a problem because the closer you come to the sun, the more uh, wave particle interactions are, uh, taking play, can take place. And these, of course, produce turbulence, which would uh, then <clears throat> scatter the particles. <coughs> so uh, usually it is assumed that, um, for example, if the termination shock particles are accelerated uh, due to wave particle interactions, but far in the tail, particles can also be accelerated. And um, I have a paper now, unfortunately not with me, I forgot it. Uh, but um, I know that uh, some colleagues now during the last uh, months, during the last year, um, they have also found uh, some hints that it's possible that there is some kind of very intense, um, intense source of uh, uh, particles which seem to come from the heliotail direction. And um, these cosmic ray particles, which are, um, are highly energetic, are thought um, to be caused by magnetic reconnection processes in the tail. And magnetic reconnection processes, in 3D at least, are usually uh, well, the partners of these, uh, of these electric fields. So the, the finding of uh, magnetic reconnection to take place in such space plasma environments depends on the fact how large this uh, electric field component is parallel to the magnetic field. And um, as we know that they are um, directly connected to each other, we can say that uh, there's high evidence that such electric fields are connected also with that, uh, particles which come from the heliotail. This is only, as I said, um, some, some first, some new results which are, take, uh, which are taken from some colleagues. And um, this electric field uh, here, this uh, model here, comes from the, our stationary approach. But basically, one could assume that uh, magnetic reconnection in these parallel electric fields are really also a source of uh, turbulence uh, which we can find in space plasmas. Okay, so. Yeah, summary and conclusions. I think um, I will come to an end now. We have seen that uh, topological properties are very 
important to determine uh, these scenario, let's say the stage on which uh, stellar wind cavities uh, can be regarded or recognized. And um, we can see that um, even well-ordered steady-state MHD flows can be used to model this, at least uh, with respect uh, <clears throat> to a, um, a rough or crude uh, understanding of the structures, of the geometric structures of these uh, stellar wind interstellar medium interfaces, and um, that we um, had proven, I think I could uh, motivate this, that we uh, can show that uh, these current sheets or vortex sheets can be highly fragmented and can uh, reveal fractalized structures. Uh, I think we have motivated this very, very clearly. And the future will, will of course, be to uh, find also 3D solutions and um, but there are a lot of open questions, as you can see. <clears throat> Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> Thank you. It's been a very interesting talk. We don't hear uh, talks on this subject uh, very much here. Uh, so it was very ed educational also for all of us, I hope. And uh, I would like now to ask questions. Yes, Arvet. You have used only so, so formula without time derivatives. Yes. Uh, but as we know, magnetic fields are very sensible relative to time instabilities are forming. Mm. What about the solutions in this aspect? Yeah, I mentioned at the beginning there are a lot of uh, papers during the last, I would say, 10, 20 or 30 years which started to use simulations, MHD simulations, which are time-dependent. Yeah. Um, the point is, if you... Um, I would like to go into the details. Uh, okay, uh, one moment. <clears throat> uh, of course, the physics here is relatively simple, which I use. The main point is that um, if you go to... Um, uh, if you, if you um, use um, the simulations, you have relatively huge scales. Yeah? So the question is now, um, you have also very complicated boundary conditions. For example, um, they assume from measurements, they assume some conditions, which maybe, mainly, maybe they do not fix, uh, let's say, to the complete set of the system. Yeah? So the problem is every time in, in, uh, in um, MHD or HD, do you use the correct boundary conditions? So uh, one point is, for example, even if they are using a relatively symmetric model, they sometimes end up with asymmetry. So these are instabilities. The question is now, um, for such a huge environment, like the heliosphere, um, what, what about how can we get asymmetries or instabilities if the system is symmetric, for example? And um, some, some things of this, um, research seems to be um, numerical artifacts. Now, today, we are using even adaptive mesh refinement methods for MHD plasmas. So, the convergence is often much better than, let's say, in the 80s or 90s, when, when people firstly, for example, analyzed uh, reconnection outflows from the sun or from the magnetosphere of the Earth. But the point is, even in this case, um, you find uh, very strange uh, things. For example, in one of the simulations, I saw that the current sheet is bended. So, in reality, this Parker spiral is, of course, not potential. They have a non-potential. The Parker spiral uh, has a current, and they found out that the, that the um, let's say this current sheet is uh, somehow deflected away from the heliospheric nose. So, the heliosphere knows. Um, you have a pile up, they found a pile up of magnetic flux. Pile up of magnetic flux means that the magnetic field is getting there uh, extremely high. So if you want to have a magnetopause, now my question is would be to these authors, how can they get then a magnetopause when they have no null point there? So where is that null point? If, if they have a pile up of magnetic flux, you yeah, understand the problem. Because usually in, in reconnection scenarios where you have really magnetic fields encountering, you have shared magnetic fields, you can have in some region, of course, outside, you can have a pile up of magnetic flux, so magnetic field strength increases. 
But the question is, where is the decrease then? I do not see it. And uh, okay, so the simulations are very useful, I think. Um, first of all, they study cosmic ray fluxes. Yeah? So they, they study how um, do cosmic rays behave in such an MHD environment. So if you uh, want to do this with analytical methods, this is uh, very complicated. <clears throat> so these simulations are very nice. But on the other hand, if we are talking about a stellar wind cavity, and we say we want to find some kind of, let's say, averaged, time-independent view of this, then, of course, we have to go to steady state, and we have to find some relaxed state. Now, if you make a time-dependent calculation, you will every time find the system changes, changes, changes. So it looks every time different, and at some point, either it relaxes also into a numerical equilibrium, or if it does not relax into a numerical equilibrium, then the question is, of course, what is the system? Now, this is a, um, I mean, for, um, for flares, for example, this is a relatively clear thing. Now, if you look onto a magnetic loop on the sun, uh, this is, here's the solar surface, let's say, and you have a magnetic loop, then somehow you have time-dependent boundary conditions. So you have an equilibrium, you have an equilibrium, you have an equilibrium, and at some point, there's a loss of equilibrium. So what you have usually is an, an eruption, a solar eruption, which you can see from, from spacecraft like, like so or so. So you can see on, on, a, on a certain time scale, the system is quasi steady or quasi static, and at some point it erupts. So we have an instability. So at this point, it is interesting, for example, to use time dependent simulations. Yeah? You understand the point. But this is a relatively short time scale. We're talking about some minutes, and then the eruption is basically over. So f to describe a magnetospheric structures or uh, solar magnetic fields or stellar magnetic field structures in general, steady state models are at least useful, even if they are wrong. Huh? Thank you. Uh, more questions? Yes, please. Uh, you used somewhere, uh, you mentioned 2.5. What does it mean? 2.5, really? <laughs> Where? On which slide? Uh, 2.5D. Ah, 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 ah 2.5, okay. Ah. D. It was at the end, <laughs> almost at the end. Ah, yeah, okay. Uh, two, two and a half D means that, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you. It is a, basically a wrong, um, it's a wrong notion or a wrong, a wrong term which is liked to be used by solar physicists. The, the reason is um, <clears throat> that um, the uh, vector components here, you have three vector components, Bx, By, which are covered here by the poloidal field, and you have a BZ component. But all three components depend only in X and Y, so they are organized in sheets. Uh, you have it, for example, if you have a system um, which is not axisymmetric, but which is deformed, but in such a way that you can say, okay, I have uh, really the fields, they lie almost in slices, almost, yeah? really in pieces but they can show a Z component. So you have an invariant direction of the magnetic field, but it can turn. Yeah? So you can have some helical-like structures, for example. And <clears throat> to, to distinguish this from the purely two-dimensional magnetic fields, which are like in a plane, for example, if now axisymmetry or, or translational symmetry, is, it doesn't matter, uh, the, uh, this uh, scientists they have found this word two and a half D. It means that you have three components, but they de depend only on two coordinates. Okay. So this is some some strange notion. Basically, it's, I, I agree it's wrong, <laughs> because for mathematicians it would be simply two D, okay. because it, you, if you calculate the rank of the Jacobian uh, matrix, it's two, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, such problem, that's a more complicated problem. About half a century ago, our former director, Axel Kipper, uh, studied the problem of <coughs> completely <coughs> tangled magnetic field. That is, uh, if we consider photons and go to distances 
to the uh, distances greater than mean value between particles, which will be then in this case this tail of a magnetic field and uh, will be somehow the number of uh, freedom states uh, found and what is uh, its uh, contribution could be to general picture and maybe it has uh, some somehow connected with the generation of uh, stellar wind. Of the hour? Uh, stellar wind. wind. Uh, oh, he, yeah, uh, the, the question is, um, okay, I didn't completely understand the question. At the beginning you said something about uh, the, the particles are far away, or did I understand this correctly? That uh, the distances mm. which are characteristic to magnetic field mm. are much longer than distances between particles. Uh, large scale yeah, it, de <clears throat> it depends. I mean, in, in atmosphere, say. Well, usually um, the uh, length scales which we are talking about here, um, I mean, the collision length scales yeah. are uh, far larger than the system. So some people say in general that MHD um, cannot easily be used because uh, the collision length scale is, let's say, one parsec. I don't know. Maybe it's only one, uh, one tenth of a parsec. And the system is uh, only one one hundredth of part or so, so it's much much smaller. But uh, the point is that the magnetic field, of course, um, acts here like some kind of attractor of the of the, for the particles. Yeah? So it means mm -hmm. that uh, you produce the collisions basically by the electromagnetic field. So you, what you have usually are often wave-particle interactions. So the magnetic field, even if it's on on long in, on very uh, long scales, at least. And um, the length scales of changing also of drops of magnetic fields are also very long, but you have waves there. Yeah? Or as I showed, you can have, uh, although the, the field is very extended, you can have very uh, small scale spatial fluctuations. Uh, so uh, it is possible that ex uh, exactly these um, spatial um, fluctuations, and also, of course, at the end, time dependent fluctuations, that they are. Uh, uh, are <clears throat> able to make this communication between particles on one hand on the field on the other hand. Does this, uh, is, is, was this in to the direct direction of your question or uh, did I misunderstood, did I misunderstood you? <laughs> uh, because, uh, yeah, well, this is a very difficult question because um, nobody, has, be, nobody has gone there in the tail. No, nobody is there in the hero tail, has been in the hero tail. The Voyager spacecrafts I can show you. The Voyager spacecraft, um, they are uh, now 100 astronomical units, but in the wrong direction, I would say. <laughs> for, for me, at least, yeah? Because I would also int be interested in the helio tail, not only in the, in the nose, yeah, yeah? This is the nose region. But of course, the tail region, uh, nobody has gone there. And we have the only possibility is really um, to, to have some plasma instruments which can measure, which are able to measure, yeah? Um, the, the, let's say, uh, the, real, um, the real physical properties in the tail. That, uh, does this answer your question? Or? Almost. <laughs> I exactly don't ask uh, now what I asked. <laughs> uh, could, you could you tell what is, uh, um, how, how many particles per, I don't know, cubic what? These are 10 to the 4 per cubic meter, these are 0.1 or so per cubic centimeter, about. Uh-huh, okay, the density of the plasma. Yeah. Yes. But it's even lower, maybe, 10 to the, uh, 10 to the minus 2 particles per uh, cubic centimeter, so it's extremely low. It's, al it's almost a vacuum, one could say. But as I said, you have these uh, turbulent structures, if they are now really time-dependent or spatially turbulent in the sense, and um, <clears throat> they are thought to extend uh, relatively long here along the tail. So the tail can be maybe 1,000 astronomical units long. Mm -hmm. While the, um, well, the most of the people agree now, meanwhile, that Voyager has crossed the heliopause, 
in about 100, about 120, 25 astronomical units distance from the sun. But some people say, no, this is not the heliopause because uh, uh, <clears throat> we can have other different explanations for these uh, steep gradients in the, in the cosmic ray flux and so on. And as there's nobody who can really, um, well, the, as I said, the plasma instrument is not working um, very well anymore. So they cannot really say what is bulk flow and so on. And nobody can really say if this is really a stagnation region because um, most people say, well, uh, if they calculate from the data they have from Voyager, they calculate that here is some stagnation region. So the velocity is not really zero because then, well, you see, Voyager has gone two here, one, one has gone here, and here is the stagnation point. Huh? Mm -hmm. yes. but, but if you go into this region here, you can, of course, see that velocity They were sent in the wrong direction. Case. Yeah, okay, but I mean, basically, Voyager were only planned for to work for 20 years, let's say, yeah. and uh, they visited Jupiter and uh, yeah. so on, and uh, now yeah. they are most, they are almost out of order. And I think even Pioneer, um, I don't know, I think the direction was different. Denis uh, had something. It's now out of order, so. Denis also had some uh, question. Yeah, I, I, I had the, uh, I have, I have the question. Uh, if you detect the cosmic rays, so the in the uh, on the orbit in the orbit of uh, Earth, for example, or close to the mm -hmm. Sun, uh, are we detecting uh, detecting actually so-called solar rays, or are they actually cosmic ones? Well, <clears throat> from interstellar space. Uh, I'm not working on cosmic rays, but what I know is from uh, colleagues um, <coughs> that you have a zoo of cosmic rays. You have different kinds of solar energetic particles coming from flares, for example. Mm -hmm. They have their special spectrum. Um, then you have galactic cosmic rays, which have their special spectrum, okay. their, their behavior. And you have the so-called anomalous cosmic rays. And the anomalous cosmic rays now, this is a, a huge uh, dispute since decades. Come, do they come from the helio tail? Do they come from the uh, helio sheath, very close here to the termination shock? Uh, most of people believe in that. Although, when the Voyager crossed this region, they do not see this, this kind of shock yeah, which should produce this race. So nobody really knows it exactly. Um, there's an ongoing discussion. People are very uh, heavily fighting, he he heavily, heavy, heavily fighting about the question. And um, so I, I think the question uh, I, I cannot answer, and uh, maybe somebody of these cosmic ray people could answer this question in more detail. But, they basically, you have different spectra, so we can see, say, okay, there are some particles coming from outside, really. They are from, from, from the galaxies, from the galaxy, and um, some particles come from the sun, or from interactions also. Mm -hmm. yeah. Some giga electron volt particles are definitely galactic. No? So they are modulated by this heliosphere. I mean, there the, the, the are variations which can be observed, so, but you detect really galactic uh, particles, not, not produced in heliosphere or jail. Well, at least uh, it is considered. A question <coughs> yeah. not connected directly to your report, mm -hmm. but uh, has uh, uh, any cosmic source or uh, uh, cosmic rays detected or not? Or same for small energies, it has been, mm -hmm. but uh, for very large, not. It's a complicated problem, probably. Um, I know that there are several sources. Have, you have uh, studied in your diploma work. So, she knows better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can go. <laughs> now, yeah, well. Actually, they are considered that uh, the, 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 inter the galactic cosmic rays they are accelerated in strong magnetic fields in the central parts of a galaxy or something like that. And so they come to us. And they are modulated by heliosphere. And, uh, and they are detected, they like this, uh, I don't know if it's in English, like wide atmospheric showers or something, when a very active particle hits an atmosphere and then you have the whole cascade of particles and then you have a large area covered with detectors and, and, and these systems. But 
they are they believe to to be accelerated by strong magnetic fields near to the central regions if well okay that was 25 years ago come on <laughs> Man, yeah, i know only that there are supernovas supernovas yeah, and these also, supernova yes. revenants for example i mean uh, strong newton stars every, with extremely high magnetic field yes, as you said every, everywhere where you can find yeah. the strong magnetic field there is a possibility for particle acceleration mm -hmm. Magnetic field can everything to it. Yeah, we can explain everything by magnetic fields. Yeah. I would say more electromagnetic fields. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, one more. Yes. In your some models of this magnetic magnetic flows, you had shocks and shock waves. Are these shock waves somewhat somehow different from the flows where no magnetic fields? Uh, I think MHD shocks are very complicated because you have much more characteristics than in, in the normal MHD or HD shocks. Uh, but um, <clears throat> especially if you have a multi-fluid, like usually one would say the heliospheric um, plasma is, uh, what I also did not tell, uh, is um, in reality a multi-fluid um, environment. Of course, you have this cosmic rays electric cosmic rays, anomalous cosmic rays, and uh, you have also a lot of uh, neutral particles inside. So the question after shocks now is very, very difficult. And um, in my talk, I was mainly talking about smooth flows. The only one that's not so smooth in my flows is the fact that you can have very steep gradients uh, as shear flows, in the sense of shear flows. So you have tangential discontinuities. But I, I, I do not uh, use here MHD shocks. No? Because I'm searching for this pause. The question, what is the pause? What is the separatrix of flows? And in this case, a shock is not a separatrix. It is, um, well, some kind of discontinuous solution of MHD equations. But these solutions are basically continuous, basically. Yeah, so I would not say that within this picture, you cannot integrate somehow also shocks. But I did not talk about the termination shock. I said, well, the termination shock in the sun the, the inner solar wind is for me like, it's like a point. You know? This is the difference. So I, can, I cannot describe, let's say, the, the, the sun in, in that sense as a really as an uh, extended body with all these uh, co-rotating interaction regions. For example, the sun has fast wind, slow wind. They interact, you have shocks. Yeah? The shocks are propagating. And then some, some, uh, on some the way to the termination shock after about... 90 or 100 astronomical units, they reach the termination shock, and this material is relaxed, more or less. Uh, so um, this is something which is inside. I do, I, do not, uh, I do not care for. I'm interested really in the boundary between the interstellar medium and this, let's say, relaxed flow. And so this forms this heliopause boundary. Uh, so the question is, uh, for me, is not how is the shock looking like. And, um, when I um, see the discussions now in the heliospheric community about the termination shock, um, I think it's not uh, completely over, maybe. Because they do not even know, some people say now, even nowadays, there was never a shock. So Voyager has never crossed shock, but don't ask me. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I can answer this question. I don't think so. <laughs> so uh, these people are also fighting nowadays, and um, also about the heliopause. Uh, some people say now it is crossed, we have the signatures, I mean, you've, you've seen the, the decreases and increases of the magnetic field and also of these particles, but um, if this really is uh, then the frontier to the interstellar medium, uh, only because if you, you see some signatures from cosmic rays, for example, uh, entering from the, uh, from the interstellar side or some neutral particles, it is not clear. Because uh, from my point of view, as I said, um, as this is a multi-fluid environment, it would be better to define the pause or the heliopause you know, or an astropause by the magnetic field separatrix. But Voyager did not really find this. You know? I mean, we can look again to this, uh, these nice images. You know? I think the magnetic field never was really zero. Uh, yeah. So it is very hard to... It's in nanotesla, even it's, it's, it's very weak. It's far away from the sun, far away. But the magnetic field plays, of course, a role. But you can see here some, here some spikes, yeah, which are relatively small. So maybe Voyager was close to this null point. Yeah? Maybe. Maybe not. Yeah? You have two spacecrafts. 
and you have, uh, I mean, this is a huge region, and small spacecraft, and they measure uh, only some points. This can also be, uh, let's say, um, time-dependent fluctuations, as you said. Yeah? So to measure the magnetic field of such a huge magnetosphere is uh, very difficult. I know this all even from the Earth's magnetosphere. We have cluster. You may know maybe cluster. Cluster, these are four satellites which are flowing through the magnetosphere of the Earth. So that you can measure all plasma parameters. They are working very well. You can measure the electric field. Yeah, this is luxury. Yeah? This is con in con contrast to this, it's really luxury. You can measure the electric field. You can measure the distribution functions even. And even nowadays, uh, well, people are really, it's, it's very hard really to reconstruct the complete uh, magnetic field in the magneto tail of the Earth or at the magneto pores and also the, um, the nature of the, uh, of the plasma environment in different parts of the magnetosphere. Of course, it's much better. You know, we, there are a lot of publications in JGR or elsewhere in papers, but um, I mean, cluster is a very, very, uh, I think it was a very uh, successful project or is a successful project. But in contrast to this, the Voyager spacecraft are poorly, uh, how is it said, uh, uh, equipped. Maybe. Okay, so. I see that uh, there is very interesting problem and there can be many different solutions to it. Uh, but thank you for uh, this very nice talk. And uh, I'm kind of closing our last seminar for this season now. And see you all in September then. <laughs> Some of you earlier also. So thank you very much again. Yeah. Thank you.